So turn to Matthew 16. Um, we saw at the end of Matthew chapter 15, Jesus crossing over into Gentile territory. First, he takes the 12 disciples and they go to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Those are two cities in present-day Lebanon. It was a Gentile area. And we saw that there's this very desperate mom whose daughter was severely demon-possessed. And she was relentless. She would not go away. And the disciples are trying to say, send her away. And, you know, it was just a, a great discussion she has with the Lord. And eventually Jesus says, what great faith she has. And she heals her daughter, casts a demon out. And it was just an, an amazing scene. And, and then they travel east and they go around. It says they skirt the north of the Sea of Galilee. And they come back into Gentile territory um, where the Decapolis, the Ten Cities, it's on the east side of the George, uh, Sea of Galilee. And Jesus begins healing all kinds of people. It started off with one man who was um, uh, deaf and he was dumb and he couldn't you know, do much. They bring him to him. Jesus sticks his, I love the story, he sticks his fingers in the guy's ear and then he spits on his hand and he wipes the guy's tongue. <laughs> No, it's not COVID friendly, but it doesn't matter. So the guy's healed. And then because of that, and Jesus says, now don't tell everybody about this. But the guy, obviously, he's healed. So he goes and tells everybody about it. So thousands, literally thousands of people flock to Jesus. And from day to night, I mean, all throughout three days, he's healing everyone they bring to him. And then at the end of the three days, he says, the, okay, the disciples, they're hungry. I don't want to send them away hungry. I have compassion for the multitudes. And they're like, well, there's no place around here to feed them. There's no In-N-Out burgers nearby. So, you know, what are we going to do? And, you know, they'd already forgotten about the feeding of the, you know, 15, 20,000 Jews. No, that was just a chapter earlier. But they didn't think Jesus could do that or would do that with the Gentiles. And so, again, Jesus is breaking down all these barriers, um, their preconceived ideas concerning the Jewish Messiah, and why he came. Because Jesus loves everybody. Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for everybody. He offers eternal life to anybody who will believe in him and receive him as their Lord and Savior. Now, not everybody's going to get saved. Obviously, the narrow road is Jesus. The wide, broad road is everybody doing their own thing. Many are on that broad road that leads to destruction. But Jesus offers eternal life to anyone and all who will come to him by faith. So after blessing the, this huge crowd of Gentiles, he feeds them miraculously with the seven loaves and the you know, few small fish. He and the 12 disciples, they get in the boat, they go to Magdala, which is on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Mary Magdalene was from. And we see this whole different scene before us now as we come into chapter 16, because here Jesus is met by the religious leaders, and they look at Jesus a whole lot different. And it's a huge contrast because the multitudes of humble, simple, you know, Jews and Gentile people, they loved everything about Jesus. But the religious leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they could not stand him. So it says in chapter 16, verse 1, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, which is never a good thing to test Jesus, asked that he would show them, notice, a sign from heaven. First of all, these are strange bedfellows. Indeed, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were complete opposites. The Pharisees were like the... <laughs> like the very conservative Republican Party today. <laughs> the Sadducees are like the very liberal, you know, Democratic Party today, the progressives or whatever. They, they were like these opposite extremes. The Pharisees were very legalistic. They held tightly to the Word of God, but they added a bunch of their own rules, rituals, and regulations onto the Word of God, and they made God's Word a heavy burden. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they took away from the Word of God. They were not straightforward about the clear teachings of God's Word. And so they take away, and, and we're, we'll be told later, they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't even believe in the resurrection of the dead. It's like, why do you call yourselves religious people? You don't even believe these things. And so this combination, it was really an odd thing, but these two very extreme groups, they come together, join forces against Jesus. We see the same thing in the world today. You can have all these different weird evil groups that come against God's plans and purposes. 
coming against God's church. And they might not have anything to do with each other in the world, but when it comes to coming against God's plan, His righteousness, then they will join forces. So it says they come to Jesus and test Him by asking Jesus to show them a sign from heaven. In other words, they're wanting Jesus to do something like what they thought Moses did. A sign from heaven. Moses, they looked at him as the one who called manna down from heaven. Or Elijah, they look at Elijah. He called fire down from heaven. So we want that kind of a sign from you, Jesus. They've already dismissed Jesus and all the miracles that he's been doing. I mean, show us a sign? Oh, come on. You know, he raised the dead. He cast out demons, cleansed lepers. Open up blind people's eyes. I mean, miracle after miracle. And yet, why didn't they not believe him? Because they were attributing those miracles to Satan, Beelzebub. He's doing it in the power of the enemy. And so it didn't matter what Jesus did. They said, you're guilty. But he says, no, you're guilty. You're close to being lost forever because, you know, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is attributing all that Jesus did to Satan. This also shows us that they were dead wrong about Moses and Elijah. They put these guys in a pedestal, and they assumed that they were responsible for all the miracles that they did. But no, it was the Lord who did everything. Moses and Elijah were just like you and me. They were vessels that God worked in and worked through and did these amazing things. Jesus makes this clear. Look at these verses, John 6 Starting in verse 32, then Jesus said to them, he's speaking to the multitudes, they're saying, hey, we want to see a sign. You know, uh, what do we have to do? What good works we have to do to do the works of God? Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in me, whom the Father has sent. So he says to them, most surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He, Jesus, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He'll go on to explain and tell them that He's the bread of life, and everybody who comes to them, you know, Him who wants eternal life, He will give them eternal life. They just need to put their faith and trust in Him alone. But He said, Moses didn't give you the bread. It was my Father. And I'm the true bread that the Father has now sent, and you can have life in me. So a few verses later in John 6, verse 40, Jesus goes on to tell them, This is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. So again, these religious leaders had no clue to who Jesus Christ was and what He was doing they have no clue to what they're asking Jesus to do. They're spiritually blind. And again, it didn't really matter how many miracles, how spectacular his miracles were, they were never going to be satisfied with Jesus. Because to these evil men, it was all about holding on to their power. Again, nothing new under the sun. Why we see so many crazy things happening in the governments of the world right now? Because they don't want to let go of their power. You know, there are simple solutions to so many things that are happening in our nation, in, the, in other parts of the world, but most politicians will do whatever they think is necessary to hold on to their authority, their power. So show us a sign from heaven. Verse 2, He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, there's an old saying that came out of this. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. Red sky at night, sailors delight. They knew how to read the sky, you know, the, the, what's going on in the atmosphere. They knew when the weather was going to be bad. So Jesus is saying, you guys can discern what is happening in the physical realm, but you're clueless when it comes to who I am, why I'm here, you know, the reasons I was sent from heaven to earth. You don't know what the kingdom of God is all about because their misperception of the Messiah was that he was going to come, he's going to conquer the Roman Empire. That's what they're thinking at this time. 
and he's going to drive out the Romans, establish his kingdom on earth, and live happily ever after. That's what they wanted the Messiah to do. They were clueless that, no, he'll do that at the end of the age. We're going to go to be with him. We're going to come back with him. He's going to establish his kingdom. But then he came the first time to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He came to die for our sins. Sin is the worst enemy. Not any government, not any army. doesn't matter how many troops Russia puts around Ukraine or China puts around Taiwan, their ships. The real enemy is sin, and Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. Unfortunately, there are some people in the world and in the church today that think just like these Pharisees. They think, oh, Jesus can't come back until we Christianize the whole world. That's not going to happen. Things are going to go from bad to worse. The Bible is very clear. In the last days, men's hearts go from bad to worse. Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Human hearts are becoming harder and harder in these last days. So Jesus wants us to discern the signs of the times. And what we're seeing in the world around us today is exactly how Jesus described what things would be like in the last days, just before he comes for his bride, his church, and then what will happen with Israel during what we call the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble, actually Jeremiah says that, the 70th week of Daniel, the final seven-year period, dealing with the Jews, also called the Great Tribulation, a seven-year period when the Antichrist is going to be on the scene for seven years, but that's when God is dealing directly with the Jewish people once again. It'll be a time of judgment, as God will pour out His wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. It'll be a time when the Antichrist is going to rule for a short time, and it'll be a time when all the rulers of the world are going to be drawn into this little valley in Israel called the Valley of Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon takes place at the end of Revelation 16. It says Satan will send out these demons and they'll draw the people there. I've been there you know, four different times. It's a, an amazing scene. You're in Megiddo looking down over this valley. The first time I was there was really cool because we we're just talking about these things. All of a sudden, these two F-16 you know, Israeli jet fly, fighter pilots go whoa, ripping right down really low right through the valley. And we're like, ooh, <laughs> wow, well, wow, maybe it is mid-trip. <laughs> no, no. Anyway, not at all. But... That's going to be the Battle of Armageddon. So again, read Revelation 6 to 18 because it gives us a detailed account of that brutal seven-year period. But much of the church today is asleep at the wheel. They're oblivious to what's going on in the world around us and the soon return of Jesus for His bride and that we are about to be caught up into His presence at any moment. Nothing has to happen for the rapture to happen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up into His presence. You know, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain, if it's today, that would be us, will be caught up together with them. The word caught up, harpazo in the Greek, simply means to be snatched away quickly. And we'll be with them in the air, with, with the Lord, and we're going to be up in glory. That word harpazo is also used. Remember when Philip was in the desert and he was baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch? You know, and he's leading him to Christ because he's out there waiting. God told him, go out in the desert. He's out there in Gaza. Here comes the Ethiopian eunuch and this big entourage. And he hears him reading from the scroll of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, about the Messiah, the Lamb, led to slaughter. And... Philip says, do you know what you're reading? He goes, no, I don't have anybody interpret this for me. And so Philip joins up with him, and he leads him to Christ based on Isaiah 53. It's all about Jesus. And then he's guy's like, hey, what prevents me from getting baptized? There's water right there out in the middle of the desert, a little mud puddle. Well, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe. Okay. So he baptizes him. It says he goes under the water, he comes up, and it says when he came up out of the water, Philip was no more because he was taken away. Harpazo. Instantly, it says, and he was in Azotus, 40 miles away. That's a good way to travel. And that's how we're going to get to travel when we get our resurrection bodies, by the way. But anyway, that's, I don't know where I was. <laughs> Got off on a tangent. Sorry. But, okay. So, um, yeah, everybody's waiting for things to get back to normal in the world. Really? What does normal look like? We don't know what normal looks like. I mean, shut down for two weeks to flatten the curve. Well, we did that. 
Now, two years later, there's still a lot of churches closed. There's still a lot of people that are staying away. They're afraid and all these things. We were promised after the vaccine, everything is getting back to normal. Well, that didn't happen. Here's what I see happening. Masses, massive amounts of people are being conditioned to follow, listen to everything the governments of the world tell them to do. Like Austria right now, a couple days ago, said we are mandating every single person in Austria must be vaccinated. I haven't heard the or else yet, but they've mandated every single citizen of Austria must be. Some countries are waking up. Sweden, Denmark, Norway, they're like, we're done. <laughs> We're over it, and they're just going back to their normal. So I said this over a year ago. Unbelievers are being conditioned to obey the soon arrival of the Antichrist. And one of the biggest things that he will implement is the mark of the beast. It's his identification code that everyone in the world will be gone, but those left behind, they'll be mandated by the Antichrist to receive the mark of the beast. I've had people all the time, is this, you know, vaccine, the mark of the beast? No, it's not that mark of the beast. You know, it, don't think it is. It's not. If a person refuses the Antichrist mandate, we know what happens. They will be put to death. It's funny. Some countries have actually put these concentration camps, as I call them, there, and they're saying, if you don't get vaccinated, we're going to you know, isolate you over here. For how long? For what reason? You know, you can get the shot. You still get sick. You can still pass it on. I don't have to get the shot. I got sick. I can still pass it on. What's the difference? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know. Do what you need to do. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart. But we're not just there yet, but it's easier to see how this will all come together because we're seeing things like we've never seen in human history before. When it talks about in the book of Revelation, when the two witnesses are put to death, their bodies are lying in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, and it says the whole world can see them lying in the streets. Well, that certainly didn't happen in 70 AD. That didn't happen, you know, 500 years ago. The whole world can't see any event happening anywhere in the world except in our time, you know, since satellite, you know, TV and all the things that are happening technologically. Now people can see an event happening all over the world, anywhere in the world, all in live, you know, stream or whatever it might be. Look at these verses, Revelation 13, starting in verse 16. This is speaking of the mark of the beast, the Antichrist mark that he will mandate, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Verse 18 tells us his number is 666. At the same time, God's word is crystal clear that if anyone receives the mark of the Antichrist, they will face judgment. They will face God's fullness of wrath, eternity in torment away from the presence of the Lord, if they take the mark of the beast during that time. There's a prominent pastor, and I appreciate a lot that he has done out in Southern California, but he, he'll say, well, even if you get the mark of the beast, you can still come to Christ. That's not what the Bible says. And here's the verses that say this is not what the Bible says. Revelation 14, verse 9. This is right after God sends an angel with the everlasting gospel to preach to every tribe, tongue, nation, and people in the world. That's the fulfillment of Matthew 24, 14, where this gospel has to go to the whole world. We're not going to make it happen, but we should be trying to get the gospel out to as many people as we can, but it's fulfilled there in Revelation 14, 6. But in verse 9, he says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, speaking of the Antichrist, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So I don't think there's any wiggle room here to say, well... There's exceptions. No. He shall be, the one who takes his mark of the beast, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, that's Jesus, 
The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. So it's not annihilation. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So that's a heavy-duty warning of things to come. Again, the amazing thing to me is that we see how quickly this can be implemented upon the world today. Again, the technology is there to do so much of what Revelation speaks of. And it's only in our generation that we have been able to see how these things can take place, like numbering every person in the world. So we're living, as some call it, the times of the signs. <laughs> Jesus says, you know, beware of the signs of the times, but we're also in the times of the signs getting close. So he calls them hypocrites. They can recognize the you know, worldly, fleshly, you know, earthly things happening, but they have no clue about Jesus and what he is doing, who he is. So verse 4, Jesus tells them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. The word seeks literally means to crave. You know, we all have cravings. So we had a funeral yesterday for Donna Perkins. Some of you remember Donna, wonderful lady, went home to be with the Lord. And it was great because all the promises of God were fulfilled in her. She took her last breath here on earth. Last Sunday afternoon is when she went home to be with Jesus. That's why I didn't mention anything last Sunday about it. But, you know, the, the funny thing is, I mean, she, she was a Broncos fan her whole life until two years ago she became a Kansas City Chiefs fan. For some weird reason, she liked Patrick Mahomes. That was like, she even had a Mahomes jersey, <laughs> and it was here on display. So anyway, um, where am I going with that? Well, she, her daughters were with her last week, Sunday. Hey, we're going to watch a game together, Kansas City Chiefs, Cincinnati Bengals. And halftime, Chiefs are winning 21-3. to And she goes, I'm tired. I need to take a nap. She slept for a little bit, woke up for 10 minutes, fell back asleep, and then went home to be with Jesus. Yeah, I think God was sparing her because the Chiefs got blown out in the second half. <laughs> That's awesome because, you know, it's like the Lord's like, I don't want Donna to have that last remembrance of the Chiefs blowing it. <laughs> we joke about it, but yeah, I mean, she is at home. She's at rest to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. So that is where she is. Praise the Lord for that. But we're living in these weird times. So here he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after, craves after a sign. We can, I crave chocolate. That's not good. But they crave after a sign. No sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Notice, and he left them and departed. Now this is the second time Jesus has... Um, told these religious leaders, no sign is going to be given to you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. He's, he's told them before, a wicked, adulterous generation seeks, craves after signs and wonders. The problem is, it's not the signs and wonders, it's that we need to be craving after Jesus. We should be seeking Him first and foremost. They were not. We should be desiring a closer relationship with Jesus. But they just wanted to see spiritual stuff happen. And that's a problem with a lot of people in the church today. They bounce from one place to another, seeking some, well, it's happening over here. We got people barking like dogs and crowing like roosters and you know, doing somersaults down the aisle. The spirit must be moving until the next wave of some weird thing happened. We got to go there because we want these signs and wonders. We want to prove that Jesus is real. No, by faith we believe in Christ, not by signs and wonders. We should all be longing for a closer walk with the Lord, a more intimate relationship with Jesus. We got to be careful because if we just crave... At, signs and wonders are great. Gifts of the Spirit are wonderful. The fruit of the Spirit is amazing, but the giver of those things is who we seek, who we should be craving after first and foremost. Seek first the kingdom of God. Remember Matthew 6, 33. All these other things will be added to you. God will do what He wants to do through you, in you, blessing others with the gifts and the, the fruit, but we seek Him first and foremost. 
It's interesting, the very last sentence in this verse says, and he left them and departed. In other words, Jesus will eventually leave those who reject him and the free gift of salvation he offers them. Uh, a good example of this is the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is not in the church. He's outside the church. It says knocking. Hey, anybody in there? If you'll open the door, if you hear my voice, you can let me in. I'll come in. I'll dine with you and he with me. They didn't want him because they were saying, and he, Jesus says, you guys are saying, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I'm in need of nothing. Sounds like the name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it, church. We don't need Jesus. We just want the stuff he's got for us. And he's on the outside. Hey, guys, anybody in there? Anybody want to have a relationship with me? For you and me, for all of his disciples, we never have to worry about Jesus departing from us. The Lord gave us these promises. Hebrews 13, the end of verse 5, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You have to write that one down. It's not on the screen. He says, he will never leave you. The Lord will never forsake you. The very last thing Jesus says in this Gospel of Matthew is, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But the ultimate sign of Jesus is his glorious resurrection from the tomb, as he says here. Just like the prophet Jonah. He was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. And then he was barfed up on the beach. Well, that's how I look at it. There's only two ways out of a whale, and that's a preferable way, I think. You know, be barfed up on the beach. So that's how I look at it. If you look at it any other way, you got a twisted mind. Sorry. <laughs> but he says it's like that. I was dead and buried three days in the heart of the earth. Three days he was in the tomb. And then he was not regurgitated, he was resurrected from the tomb. That's the sign, he says. And if people don't believe that ultimate sign and that ultimate wonder of the resurrection of Christ, there is nothing else that Jesus can do to convince someone that he is who he claims to be, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. If Jesus didn't rise from the tomb, then anything and everything he said, you can just dismiss it. Because it's all based on the fact that he had to die for our sins, he was buried in the tomb, and he rose victoriously from the grave. And in fact, that's so important. The guards, remember after Jesus rose from the dead and the guards are shaking, they were fearful, they go to the chief priests, these religious leaders, and they gave him money. Tell the people who ask you what happened at the tomb, well, we fell asleep and they stole Jesus' body away, his disciples. And they took the money. What? That's like one of the worst lies of all time. You're robbing people of the only hope of salvation by saying, no, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, even though they knew it. they rather have the money. There's so many people in the world like that. They know the truth, but they would rather fall for the lies. Verse 5. Now, when the disciples had come to, to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread and then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So again, he gives them a warning, and this is a warning that's for us as well, about the leaven, the false teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Again, the Pharisees added to the Word of God. The Sadducees took away from the Word of God. And they're both very, very wrong in the eyes of the Lord. When Moses was nearing the end of his life and he couldn't go into the promised land, Joshua would take him in. But this is what Moses tells them in Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. And yet that's exactly what these religious leaders were doing in the days of Jesus. They took away from, added to God's word. That's the sin of leaven that he's referring to. That's what Satan and, you know, when he came in the Garden of Eden as the serpent, that's what he did with Adam and Eve. You know, to Eve, oh, you surely won't die. You'll become just like God. And, oh, really? Okay, it looks pretty good. It's pleasant to the eyes. And they took of it and they ate and that destroyed their relationship with God because they disobeyed the Lord. There have been false teachers 
ever since. People are always adding to or taking away from the clear teachings of God's Word. We know that a person can only be saved by placing their faith alone in Christ alone and in His finished work that He did upon the cross and when He shed His blood for our sins. He took the wrath and judgment we deserve for our sins. He took it upon Himself. And because He rose from the dead, we can have eternal life. And then there's those who come along and say, well, that's not enough. You need to be baptized by one of our pastors. And then maybe you'll be saved. You know, it's no different than the Judaizers when they came to, you know, Paul, when he's up there in Galatia, and they said, hey, unless these Gentiles are circumcised according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's adding to the Word of God. You know, there's a lot of groups around today. It has nothing to do with salvation or your relationship with the Lord, but they'll say, well, you have to dress a certain way. You have to have your hair a certain way. You have to eat certain foods. You only can worship on this day. You can't worship on that day. Again, there's nothing there that has anything to do with worshiping God in spirit and truth. But they were and they are all about the external appearance rather than the internal eternal changes that the Lord is doing in our hearts. Once again, the disciples are slow to understand what Jesus is talking about. He's telling them, watch out for the leaven, you know, the sin that spreads. And so notice what they say, verse 7. They reason among themselves, saying, it's because we have taken no bread. Now don't forget, these are the apostles. These are not the b apostles. <laughs> We would do the same thing if we were there. You know, we'd be clueless. You know, we'd be like Adam and Eve in the garden. Nobody said, well, if I was in the garden, I would have, you know, like Emily said, yeah, the Naga tribe, we'd kill that serpent and eat it. It's like, no. Nah. <laughs> we would all fall just like, we'd all be like these guys. You know, Jesus is still working on them like he's working on all of us. And he's going to use these B apostles or the apostles to build up the kingdom of God. But Jesus, being aware of it, verse 8, said to them, Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? Come on, guys, you really think I'm concerned about the fact that you didn't bring any bread? <laughs> I could turn this boat into a loaf of bread if you want. I mean, come on. That's not what it's all about. Don't you remember feeding the 5,000 Jewish men and all their wives and children and then the 4,000 Gentile men and all their wives and kids? Come on, seriously? It's not about bread. Verse 11, how is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Again, the leaven... He's talking about it has nothing to do with bread. Uh, leaven is yeast. You put it in the bread dough, and it putref literally it putrefies the bread dough. That's why it swells up. That's a picture of sin, spreading and swelling up. In the Bible, leaven always refers to sin. If it goes unchecked, it can quickly spread in your life. In your group, if you guys start tolerating certain things that the Bible says that's sin, and you say, no, no, it's okay, we're under grace, it's going to turn to leaven. It'll you know, spread. Jesus says, no, don't let these things spread. Paul uses the illustration of leaven in both examples of false teaching and in sinful behavior. The first one, it's in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 7. This is what Paul says after, when he says at the beginning here, your glorying is not good. He's referring to the fact that they were so open-minded. Hey, we got our brother in the church here. He's sleeping with his dad's wife. Ha, huh, we're so tolerant. We're under grace. I mean, that's literally what they were doing. And that's why Paul says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So again, Paul's point is, as followers of Jesus, we need to turn from sinful things, turn back to the Lord when the Holy Spirit brings that conviction. What you're doing is wrong. 
because those things will pull us back into the muck and mire that Jesus has delivered us from. This verse, Galatians 5, 9, this is speaking of false teachers. Paul simply says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Again, the Judaizers came into uh, the, the territory of Galatia. There's a lot of churches in Galatia that Paul established, and they were saying, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to get circumcised. Before you can be a real Christian, you got to come under the law, the Jewish law. And, and Paul's like, no, that's wrong. And he gets in Peter's face and calls Peter a hypocrite. Peter, you're eating pork chops with the Gentiles. And then these Judaizers show up, and now you withdraw from the Gentiles? What a hypocrite. He calls him to his face. Again, about 10 years after Pentecost. So don't think, oh, yeah, he didn't grow in his... No, Peter played the hypocrite 10 years after Pentecost. None of us are perfect. So the doctrines of the Sadducees would be like those who say today, and there's a lot of Christians that talk this way, God doesn't care how you live your life as a Christian. You can sleep around, you can party, you can get drunk. It doesn't matter. You're under grace. God doesn't care. Wrong. God does care. Jesus died for our sins to set us free from the bondage of sin. The wages of sin is death. I've known a few people over the years, and I can't say this verse applied to them, but in the back of my mind I'm thinking this verse applied to them, where it tells us in 1 John chapter 5 that there's a sin unto death. And God can take somebody home because they're continuing to live in sin as a Christian. And I think God says, okay, you've blown your witness long enough. Let me get you out of here before you blow it anymore. I've known a few people that it's like, yeah, maybe that's what happened. They didn't repent. They're still in God's hands, but I think God in His mercy took them out before they could do more damage. Jesus died. He shed His blood. Not that we could be free to continue to live in sin. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. This is Paul writing to the church. These are believers. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Again, the doctrines of the Pharisees go to the other extreme. They try and place more and more rules and rituals and regulations upon you. And they make you look, they try to make you look more holy and righteous on the exterior. You know, they want you to appear to be above everybody else. But the bottom line is Jesus is the one who saved us. And Jesus has completely forgiven us of all sin. We are new creations in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. We are completely holy. Now, when you look in the mirror, you're like, eh. No, in Christ, you're completely holy, completely righteous, completely forgiven. That's our position in Christ. This is how Paul says it in Colossians 2.9. For in Him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And so if we are complete in Christ, that means you cannot do anything to add to or take away from your salvation. You're complete. God sees the finished product. We don't, but He is still working on us. He's still molding us. He's still shaping us more and more in the image and likeness of Jesus. That also means that the most important point in being a Christian today is to grow in our relationship with Christ. Not trying to keep all these rules, rituals, and regulations that other people put on us, but everything, doctrine, theology, should all draw us closer to an intimate relationship with Jesus. We should live for Him because we love Him. We should obey His Word because we love Him. We should serve the body of Christ around us because we love Him. We should reach out to lost, dying sinners because we love the Lord and we, He's put His love in our heart for them. And genuine biblical doctrines should always lead us to a closer, more intimate relationship with Christ. The doctrines of the Pharisees and Sadducees will always drive a wedge between you and the Lord. Again, this is why Jesus told us back in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who labor 
are heavy laden, you're burdened down, and it's by the law, and I will give you rest. Jesus has fulfilled all the law in our place. Verse 11 of the Pharisees and Sadducees, it becomes a heavy burden of works, a burden of sinful activity. So he says, beware. Verse 12, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so again, the proverbial light bulb comes on. Oh, now we know what you're talking about. Now we know why you're here. Now we know why you came from heaven to earth. That is what is most important. Now, I'm going to close with these next few verses, and we're going to pick up with these verses next week, but I want to give you a preview because these are two of the most important questions that must be asked and answered. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, those of us who've been there, it's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, beautiful area. He asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So again, who do people, who do all these masses of people say that I am? Obviously, Jesus knows exactly who he is, the Son of Man, the Son of God. He, there, no question in his mind, but he wants to ask the disciples, now who do these other people say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist. Why? Well, remember when King Herod put John the Baptist to dead, death, and he hears about Jesus doing all these miracles, Herod Antipas said, it's John the Baptist raised from the dead. And then some say you're Elijah. Again, Elijah, he's the powerful Old Testament prophet. He's coming before the great and notable day of the Lord. The very last verses in Malachi, the Old Testament, talk about Elijah must come before the great and dreadful day. <gasps> he's probably Elijah. The Lord's getting ready to set up his kingdom. Others say Jeremiah. Why Jeremiah? Because Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Jesus wept. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years in Jerusalem, and he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came. They hauled him off into captivity. And so he says, well, this, he, maybe you're Jeremiah. Even today, people have all these differing opinions about who Jesus is. Well, I think he's a good teacher. <laughs> or I think he's a good moral man, but I don't think he's God. Really? A good moral man would lie to you? Jesus said, I'm the only way, truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Well, if he's a liar, then he's not a good moral teacher. Some say, oh, he's a good philosopher. Kind of like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. No. You know, I think Jesus was you know, deceiving himself, thinking he's a god. Or maybe he was a god, but we can become a god just like him, as so many around us tell us. Now comes the all-important question, though, from Jesus. Look at verse 15. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Again, this is the most important question of all because the way you answer this will determine where you're going to spend eternity. That's what it boils down to. If Jesus came to you and he stood before you right now and he asked you, who do you say that I am? What would you say? You know, if you're saved, like most of us in here, I'm sure your answer would be something like, well, Jesus, I... I believe you're the Savior. You're my Lord. You're the King of Kings. You're the great I Am. You know, as you grow in your relationship with the Lord, you see all these other attributes attributed to Jesus. You know, you're the light of the world. You're the vine. You know, you're the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through you. You're the wonderful counselor. You're the Prince of Peace. You're the, you know, the Alpha and Omega, the finisher, the, or author and finisher of my faith. But listen, one of the ways that we prove to a world around us, who Jesus is in our lives is by how we live our lives in this world. If we're just living like the world around us, living in sin and rebellion, you know what you're saying? Man, yeah, Jesus doesn't mean that much to me. Because I'm just living like the world. If he's your Lord, your Savior, your Master, you realize, no, he bought me with a price. His blood. I don't, I'm not my own any longer. I belong to Him. I want to live my life for Him, for His glory. 
This is who Jesus really is. He's the perfect Savior. He loved a sinner like me so much he willingly died in my place, took the punishment, the penalty for my sin upon himself. And he, you know, he's not done with me, Lord. I know you're not done because you're still molding me, shaping me. I'm far from perfect. I still stumble, but you are faithful to pick me up. You're faithful to see me through. And so that's what we should be telling people when they say, well, who is Jesus? Who do you say Jesus is? We should be able to say, let me tell you about my Jesus based on the Word of God. Not our opinion, but what does the Word of God tell us about Jesus? And have we embraced the biblical Jesus? That's the all-important question. So we'll end here. We'll pick up, Lord willing, next week.